So honeybees are mysterious. We have a lot going on outside. For example, look how this milkweed grabs onto the legs of these honeybees while they try to pollinate it and get nectar. They twist and spin and try to get away. There's a lot going on in nature. This honeybee is working on this milkweed, just getting resources to bring home to the hive. But the question we're gonna to answer today is, what goes on inside that beehive? What happens when they get home? What can we see beyond the landing board? If you recently saw my video quiz of inside hive behaviors, you need to uh, watch this one and get an explanation. If you haven't watched that video yet and you want to test yourself, look for the inside the hive video quiz and see what you see first. Then we're going to explain it with this video. We're looking at the landing boards of several hives in my apiary. Look at all the activity. There's a nectar flow on, and they are bringing it in just as fast as they can. And this is the landing board of a flow hive. And look at all the bees congregating on the face of it. There's a slatted rack there that's supposed to prevent bearding. But it doesn't. They're all gathered here underneath the uh, hive visor here, which gives them shade. And there are thousands of bees coming and going. Why are they outside? But what goes on inside? This is a flow hive 210 frame. And they are super active as well. Look at all the bees fanning and venting, trying to get that nectar dehydrated down until it's the perfect consistency for honey. So in this video, we're going to take you inside. Now these are standard hive bodies, 10 frame, 8 frame. But what we're looking at here is my honeybee shed. And that white entrance here on the side is where my observation hive bees come and go. But it looks mysterious. What goes on inside? What happens when they go through this inch and a half diameter tube? What's going on on the honeybee frames? That's what we're going to answer in this video. They're all venting, taking advantage of this summer day. It's the 4th of July and there's a lot going on. Now let's test your knowledge. Look at this frame. This worker bee is fanning her wings and keeping the air flowing across a frame of brood. The other nurse bees that you see tucking their heads in quickly and walking past, they're providing nutrition for developing larvae. And the covers, the caps of these brood frames are porous so that the developing pupa inside can uh, breathe and have a gas exchange there. And it's the worker bee's job to keep air moving across it. We're looking through a glass panel here so that we can see the inside and notice what's going on and we're going to show you lots of details. So again if you haven't tested yourself first on the video quiz you might want to jump to that and see what you observe on your own and then come back to this video and listen to the explanation. So we know that there are lots of bees inside the colony. There are drones which are the males. There's the queen which lays eggs. And there are the workers, which have lots of different jobs. What are we looking at here? This is what we call open brood. These are larvae that you can see here, the little white grubs. And they're expanding and contracting. And they're actually moving in circles. The nurse bees that are visiting these cells are dipping their tongues and contributing a royal jelly mixture that's going to feed these developing larvae until they reach the point of being capped. And these are actually very large larvae here. These are within a day or two of being capped over. In fact, by the end of this video, we show segments that have them completely capped. Now, once they put the cap over and they become pupae, they're no longer considered larvae, they require no further nourishment from the bees. So the only work that has to be done once they're capped is to make sure that there's an air exchange and that the temperatures are controlled. They're going to be at roughly 95 degrees, so if it's a hot day outside, which it is today, then you'll be able to actually see the brood and the larvae, which we can now because it's 95 degrees inside this shed. Now if this observation hive were cooler, if it's nighttime, we wouldn't even be able to see this larvae because the bees would be collected over the top of it and using their bodies to generate the heat that's necessary to keep the temperature constant to protect them. 
So these are extremely healthy. There is lots of liquid around them, which is their food, as I explained before. And you can see them pulsing and undulating. They are growing fast. Now once they're capped, how long does it take before they emerge? Seven days. How long does it take from the time an egg gets laid to the time it goes through all of its development stages and hatches out as a new adult bee? 21 days. So in this video we're just going to cruise along and look at a lot of behaviors and I will explain those for you. Otherwise just sit back and enjoy the view. Look at these. Pulsing and moving, you can see them expanding and contracting, absorbing all that rich goodness that the nurse bees have put in there, mixing their enzymes with what's called bee bread. Bee bread is pollen. Pollen has been brought into the colony, and, we're, and see that vibrating bee there? Pollen is brought in, and then the bees process it. They add nectar to it. They add honey to it. It ferments, and then the bees reabsorb it. The nurse bees do. And then they have glands that generate what's necessary to grow the bees to adulthood. And that's what's being excreted into these cells. How many times do they visit these cells? They feed them over a thousand times a day. So it is a constant effort. You can see this out of focus bee in the foreground, rubbing back and forth across the surface, cleaning the interior of the glass with its tongue. That's the reason we're able to even look inside. Without the bees cleaning these smooth surfaces, we wouldn't be able to see what's going on in the hive on this uh, brood frame. And we can tell that the wax that's drawn out here is intermediate, it's not brand new, and it's not old. Notice that it's got a tan cinnamon color to it. The older the wax is, and the more that the bees have walked on it, the darker it becomes. Notice as the nurse bees walk over, they just momentarily dip their heads in, and they are contributing food. That's it. Now some of the food, when you look at uh, the larva here, can appear a little yellow, a little orange, and that in some cases is because the light that I'm using here is passing through the cell walls and taking on a yellow or orange cast. That's not to say that some of the food they are contributing does not have a golden tint to it. It may. And you look at the cell there at the 7 or 8 o'clock position, it appears golden yellow, and that's because whatever that nurse bee contributed there does have a honey tint to it. The rest of them, in comparison, have a clear liquid. Royal jelly is fed to all bees. It's just the amount of royal jelly that gets fed that dictates whether or not this will be a worker or a queen. And it's an amazing thing that by modifying diet alone, you can affect what cast B is going to come out. In fact, a queen only takes 15 days to develop and hatch, but the cells are larger and the amount of food they contribute is in much greater quantity and greater frequency. 1,700 visits a day or more to feed a developing queen. Now, all the movements that you're seeing here are in real time. So these little grubs, these developing larvae, are very active. And you notice some of them are turning clockwise, some of them are turning counterclockwise. It just matters which direction their head is facing. They move towards their head. And they are constantly consuming and getting larger.
Now this is a broader view of a brood frame. And you can see that the lower left there, those are capped cells. So again, once they're at that stage, there's no more feeding. Those bees are on their own. The ones that need all the attention are these open cells. And you can see the bees working across it. Now the out of focus, yellow and orange bits that are in the foreground here are actually on the glass and we consider that burr comb. And that's just wax and propolis that the bees have attached to the glass and they use it to modify their environment. And we already know that propolis within the hive provides an antibacterial condition so that germs are defeated by propolis. And that comes from tree resins. And notice how many of the nurse bees are working across here and how quickly they dip their heads and move on to the next one. Just the right amount is being added to each cell to keep them going. And this goes on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Here's a broader view showing partially cap cells. And remember the cap cells are permeable, so they breathe through them. And you'll also see some bees here, like the one near the six o'clock position that is just fanning its wings as much as it can. And that's to keep the air moving through there. Bee space is about nine millimeters. And that's the space between the surface of the brood and the interior glass. And you'll notice that the bees that are fanning their wings are oriented in different directions, and that's to keep the air moving. You look, there's another one around the two o'clock position, and it is fanning as well, and they can move air throughout the hive by orienting their bodies in different directions and circulating it. The main entrance to this hive is an inch and a half in diameter, and there are two inch and a half diameter vents inside the bee shed. Top right corner, you see another worker bee venting and fanning its wings. And there are developing larvae and eggs in that upper corner. So the darker, deeper cells, these are built upon black foundation, which come from the acorn company. And they are heavy waxed foundation that makes it easy for the bees to draw the cells out on, build their wax comb. And then by the end of the video, all of these open cells that you see here with the larvae in them will be capped. Now of all the places inside the beehive, the brood frames are the friendliest. These are the youngest bees. They haven't been out of the colony. They are not guard bees. And you could rub your fingers across this area. You could push the bees around with your fingers and they wouldn't be prone to sting you. Now on the periphery, the frames below this one and the edges of these frames would have guard bees that would challenge anyone who's encroaching on their territory. But if you're looking for the calmest bees inside the beehive, they would be here on the brood frame. And there are two right around the seven o'clock position there that are transferring resources to each other. Their tongues are extended and they're head to head. And those are bees moving resources back and forth. And the nurse bee that receives those resources heads off and starts attending to the developing larvae again. And she will continue to feed. And that saves her from having to venture out and go to the nectar frames, which we're going to show you later.
now we're on a different frame. Can you tell if this honeycomb is old or new? If you look carefully, you'll see that the comb edges are very dark. They're a dark umber color. And that's because this is the oldest comb. This is the first comb that you would come to if you came through the entrance of the hive. And all the different colored packets that you see in the cells are pollen. So the pollen deposits are here, and this is where those assisting nurse bees would travel to and from these pollen stores, transfer to the nurse bees, and they would use the glands that they have to develop the resources necessary for the larvae to be fed. So the pollen here is just to raise baby bees, and that's why it's frequently referred to as bee bread. And if you open it, you would actually be able to smell the pollen fermenting because it's added sugars that come from the worker bees. So it's not pollen straight from the field. It is deposited here and then mixed and packed in tight. Notice that it's kind of shiny. And that's because they've mixed it with nectar and honey. And that's what causes the fermentation that makes it more usable for the developing larvae. And again, this is a really old frame. It's dark comb. And I rotate these out about every three years. We don't want it to get too old and too well used. It becomes very fibrous. If you ever try to scrape this off of a frame foundation, it's very tough because there are fibers in it after it's been used for developing bees. Now we're looking at a honeycomb frame. You can see that within the cells, there are shiny bits in there and lower right here, there's one that's near full. And this is where the bees are storing nectar and dehydrating it down until it gets to the consistency for honey. How much water do they have to get rid of in order to make this stable? Well, it has to be under 20% for sure. And then the lower water percentage, the better. So if they can get it down to 15 or 16% and it is honey, then it's stable forever. And that's when the honeycomb gets capped. We're looking at the bright orange and yellow here that is, of course, pollen stores. Now we're looking in the early morning, look at the brood frame. You'll see bees that are grabbing and vibrating and they seem to be doing nothing in particular except vibrating. They are starting out their morning. So if you notice along the bottom edge of the screen, there is condensation. And that lets you know that they are not heating and they are not ventilating beyond the frame here that has brood in it. So they're keeping that section warm and they're economizing their resources. They are not heating or warming the entire hive. So if it's a larger space, they are really clustering up. Look at the lower right. What we really have there is a cluster of bees that are dormant and they don't seem to be doing anything. Sometimes bees nap, sometimes they're just resting. But one thing they are doing is providing a physical barrier between the cooler outside air and the warm hive interior. So the best insulation for bees is more bees. And now we've jumped forward. Look how clear it is now. The condensation is all gone. Also, I want you to notice we're looking at the same frame that you saw earlier that had open larvae, open brood. Now they're all capped. So the resources required for the bees to keep these going are very little because once they're capped, they are pupae and they will hatch themselves out later on. And so the worker bees, the nurse bees can take a break and they can revisit the cells that the queen would be laying new eggs in. How long would the eggs take before they hatch? A little over three days. So they get a break. And this is the same frame as I mentioned before. Look how clean everything is. The bees have licked the glass. These caps all look great. And uh, notice that there are some open cells within the field. Sometimes bees stick their bodies in those open cells. And look how many cells surround it. There are six sides to each cell. So if a heater bee stuck her body inside one cell and generated heat from her thorax, she would be heating six adjacent cells. So there again, if you look around, there's a pollen bee up there in the right hand side, right about the two o'clock position. And she's scooting up and out. Bees that come in from the field that have pollen on their legs go directly to the cells where they deposit their pollen. 
bees that come in with nectar do not go directly to cells and unload their nectar into those cells. They get interrupted by what I call storekeeper bees and they stick their tongues out and they will make that exchange and more enzymes get added. Now we're on a lower frame. This is what I call the dance floor. Bees come in from the field and they stop here and they do their waggle dances. So if you see uh, upper right there, there's one with pollen, there's two with pollen. When they first get there, they start waggling lower left, there's another one with pollen. And they waggle to the left, they do a little donut, they waggle to the right, do a little donut. And what they're doing is communicating distance and direction based on the position of the sun. That's why bees like bright sunny days. Very easy to navigate. And on overcast days, they're not so happy. But you'll notice that each of these bees is waggling different information. Sometimes it's for a pollen source. Sometimes it's nectar. The more excited they are and the longer they waggle, the better the resource and the more convinced this forager is that it's a great resource that other bees should pay attention to. Some of them you'll notice are waggling and none of the other bees are paying any attention. Others are waggling and they'll have bees next to them that are facing them, reaching out with their antennae, touching them. Everything you're seeing here would normally happen in total darkness. So the waggle dance has to be felt. That's why there's a vibration, that's why there's dramatic physical movement, and the other bees make contact while they do it. They're learning from the foraging bees exactly where the location is. Why do the waggles change direction? Well, the first waggle that they do is the distance in reference to the center where the sun is. And then the second waggle, once they've gone so far in that direction, they change and go in another direction. I also want you to notice that there are bees walking around here. Right at the 6 o'clock position now, there's a cheerleader bee. She's going along and she's grabbed, there you go, vibrating at the 3 or 4 o'clock position there. They grab other bees and vibrate them. They're let, there you go, there's another vibration. They put their body in direct contact with another worker. They grab them and they shake them as hard as they can. They're telling them that either we need pollen, we need nectar, and you need to get about doing it. Sometimes the bee that's being shaken is just sitting there doing nothing, taking a break, and they need a call to action. So on this dance floor, there's a lot going on. Information is being exchanged, motivators are getting the other bees going, foragers that have come in are probably taking a break, bees do nap, older bees nap longer than other bees, foraging bees that are older are usually the ones that are parked in the upper corners of the colony and they are taking a rest most of the night and then reactivating in the morning. So you'll see those cheerleader bees going around, grabbing the bodies of other bees, vibrating them and suggesting that they get going. Now when there are no resources, when there's a heavy rain for example, or when the weather is not supporting flight, you'll see a large percentage of bees inactive inside the colony. And there's nothing for them to do. So they're resting. But there are always nurse bees working, storekeeper bees are working, and you'll notice here right at the 4 o'clock position there are two bees exchanging resources. So. Once they have parked the resources in these cells during the day, because sometimes, as you notice in the opening, there's a lot of bees coming and going from the colonies. Sometimes they're bringing in nectar too fast, and the storekeeper bees inside the colony just park it anywhere they can find a space. Then as nightfall comes, and the foragers aren't bringing in that rush of new material, the storekeeper bees start to move those resources around at night. That's why sometimes you can see cells full of honey and then in the next morning they're gone but you can see other cells that were empty now filled. They're moving it around and resupplying it. What you're looking at here are a bunch of foragers that are on a break. They're just clinging to each other and they're relaxing. There's one here on the left at the nine o'clock position that's having trouble getting a grip on the glass there and it's sliding a little bit. Also notice that their tongues are folded back in the relaxed position. So when it goes from the head back towards the neck, that's the proboscis folded back in its out of service position. And then we need to collect nectar or share it. They'll flip that forward and extend their tongue and make the exchange from their honey stomach. 
and you can also tell that this is old comb that they're clinging to. This is very near the entrance. So while they're resting, they're also serving the purpose of providing a buffer from the temperature extremes. Now here's a worker. Remember that they breathe through their abdomen, which allows them to stick their heads completely into a frame. This is a honey frame that is uncapped, but she has her head in there and she's actually contributing to the shiny nectar that is being stored here. The more bees that pass the nectar mouth to mouth, stomach to stomach, it is kind of a crop, what's frequently referred to as a honey crop. It's a temporary storage for just nectar. Each time they pass it back and forth, they're contributing bacteria killing properties. So these antibacterial properties mixed with enzymes will result in the final stable liquid we know as honey, which as I mentioned earlier, lower water percentage, the more stable it is. We want it around 15 to 17%, definitely below 20. Anything at or above 20, it could actually ferment and start to smell sour. Here again, you can see some condensation on the glass in the lower section, and we're on the brood frames. Just noticing the different behaviors and the bees going about their daily tasks here. And again, we're on a brood frame. So what kind of frames are in the hive? We have pollen storage, which sometimes happen on the periphery of the brood. We definitely have nectar frames, which are honey supers. That's usually in the upper portions of the colony. And that's where they're storing what they're hoping is going to be winter resources. This is just a close-up of, of a worker bee, and she is on a honey frame. And there's a motivator bee grabbing this one and shaking, grabbing another one and shaking. She's a cheerleader. She wants them to get going. Maybe they're taking a little too much of a break after they've delivered their nectar. And this bee is burying her head in that cell and she's working the pollen that has been dropped off by another bee. Keep in mind the foragers kick off the pollen from their hind legs into the cells. And then another nurse bee comes along and starts packing that pollen and mixing it with enzymes from her own glands. And this is a honey super, uncapped. Look how shiny all the cells are. These are the energy resources. What's the honey and nectar used for? Well, it gives the bees energy to heat the colony to do the work that they need to do. And there's that little motivator vibration going on there. Cheerleader bees are funny. Sometimes they'll just run all over the hive for no reason, apparently. No reason that's apparent to us. Grabbing random fellow workers and shaking them violently and then moving on to the next one. I think they're a little bit annoying, probably to some. And all the bees that are shaken by that uh, motivator cheerleader bee don't necessarily take the hint and swing into action. On the flip side, sometimes they do. You'll see a bee that's sitting in suspension, relaxing, get a good shake, and then that bee just wakes up and goes right on down through the bottom and out that uh, entrance. Here are pollen resources right next to nectar resources. And then along the bottom, you get a really good look at resting bees. And again, their tongue, which is also their proboscis, is flipped back in its out-of-service position towards the neck. And they're just relaxing, hanging on. You can see them gradually sliding. And uh, probably this lucite is not the best gripping surface for them. But they are napping as best they can. And even their antennae relax. The napping bee's antennae are pointed towards the surface they're gripping. Here we are, these bees are taking a break on the brood frame. Now what's going on here? This is the uppermost frame of this eight frame observation hive. Those are eight deep frames. And what we see is the black foundation of an acorn frame. And the yellow is brand new wax. And these are the wax workers that are building out those cells. If you notice in the lower left-hand corner, you see edges that are just being started. 
As of today, this entire frame is covered in comb. And these bees are just doing their wax work. How can you tell when a worker bee is manipulating wax and working it out with their mandibles? Where do they get the bees wax? Well, the wax is excreted through their abdomen, little shingles underneath that they grab and bring forward and chew into place. And then they just uh, draw out cells this way. So these are young bees, those that still have wax glands that are functioning. Uh, look how clean their wings are, how crisp the edges are. These are in prime condition. Someone mentioned in an earlier video of this sequence that they saw a Varroa. If you see one, please put the timestamp down in the comment section so that we can look that over and make sure that that is hopefully not the case. Now these are pre-waxed frames and they're heavy wax and that makes it easier for the bees to draw them out. So they've already defined in the stamp formation of these frames what the cell size should be and the bees are just accepting that and drawing out their comb, the cell walls, with their wax building. So they're using wax that's already there and they're contributing their own to it as they draw it out. And then once it gets to about an eighth of an inch deep, the queen might actually come through and lay an egg in partially developed cells. And then the workers come through and continue to develop those cells even while the larvae are developing. And here we are, you're seeing the wax workers actually doing their thing. They have a tendency to wobble their heads side to side while they're shaping wax and they're using their mandibles. So if you see a bee from the back and its head is wobbling side to side and it seems to be chewing on the edges of a cell, that's a wax worker. And they're carefully shaping it. Of course, all the wax uh, cells are hexagonal. in each cell, unless it's on the edge, there's that motivator bee. She's decided that somebody's goofing off. You can grab and give you a shake. So I hope that you've enjoyed watching this. I hope you learned something. The queen did not make an appearance, so if you've been straining your eyes looking for her, she's not in the video. But I hope you learned something seeing inside the hive and we will continue the series. Hopefully you will join us on Friday for frequently asked questions about beekeeping for beginners. And I appreciate that you took the time to watch this one. Happy beekeeping. <laughs>